Hello. In part one, I described the circumstances that led me back to looking at my earthquake tides and alignments charts, and in particular, the sea levels. And what we're looking at here is a chart from the Northern Pacific, and we're looking at the difference between the high and low tides every day. And these high points are showing that there's a big difference between the high and low tide on that particular day. And this low point, it shows there's a very small difference, or a much smaller difference between the high and low tide on that day. And in the last few weeks, or few months, uh, it's been falling in a 13-14 day regular pattern. And I found that very interesting. I decided to plot that on a top-down diagram of the solar system to see what it would look like. And before we look at that diagram, let's first have a look at where the data is coming from. It's coming from the National Data Buoy Center, which is part of NOAA. So let's start with the diagram for the beginning of 2010. And we're going to start with January 7, uh, January 21, February 3rd, and uh, February 17. Actually, it was very hard to determine what date it should be. I think we would, I ended up looking at other charts, which were also a lot of disturbances. It was I think I settled on March 9 for that point, and uh, March 29. And we'll plot this on the solar system diagram. So what we're looking at here is a top-down view of the solar system, with Orion located to 12 o'clock, and the galactic core down at 6 o'clock, and this is the Earth's orbit around the Sun, which is of course anti-clockwise, this is Mars's orbit, and this is Jupiter's orbit. And since this is in 2010, we can see Alanin sitting over here on its way in. So let's take a close-up view of the Earth and Moon on February 17, 2010, for example. And on that diagram, we can draw a line between the Earth and Moonlight. So, and then we can plot it on this chart here. And this is what it looks like on our solar system diagram once we've positioned it to intersect with the Earth on February 17, 2010. We've got a line from the Moon to the Earth pointing out towards the edge of the solar system. Now when the Moon is inside of Earth's orbit, as it is here, we're using a dark blue, and when the Moon is outside of Earth's orbit, I'm going to use a light blue, such as this. So let's have a look to see if we've got any sort of triangulation of an object, perhaps, during the first part of 2010, when we trace these lines. And we're going to start with January 6, tracing a line for where the Earth would have been on January 6, out following the Moon into space, and then we've got January 21, February 3rd, February 17, March 1st, March 14, March 29, April 11, April 25, and May 9. Well, to me that looks pretty chaotic. It's in a general direction, but it's pretty chaotic. And if we were to get rid of the ones that were on the inside of Earth's orbit, and only take the ones where the Moon is on the outside of Earth's orbit, it looks a little more precise, but it's still it's not really triangulating to anything. Perhaps something way over here is best you could say, but it doesn't really look like much to me. Now let's have a look at what it looked like for the beginning of 2011. Starting with January 11, and we've got January 24, February 7, February 20, March 6, March 19, April 1st, April 15, and April 28. Um, wow, that looks more like a triangulation. Now we'll clean up a little bit, we'll just take out the ones where the moon was inside of Earth's orbit, and look at that. It really does appear to be triangulating onto something out there in space, um, as unusual as that would be. So, what about this year? Are we seeing anything like that this year? So let's have a look. The first data point we've got is January 1st, and then we follow that with January 15, we've got January 28, we've got February 11, we've got February 24, 
and we've got now March 9. And the data point we don't have yet, if the pattern was to continue, that would be March 22nd. So I've put that in orange because it actually hasn't arrived yet. We can't say that's where it's going to fall, but if the pattern were to continue, March 22nd is the next expected point. Let's take out the ones from the inside of Earth's orbit again. And that, again, is pointing to something out in space, but this time a bit further around in the orbit. It's actually about 11 days worth of Earth's orbit further around. So let's quickly refresh what we've got. This is what the diagram looked like for the beginning of 2010. And of course, on February 27, we had the Chilean earthquake. And this is what the diagram looked like for 2011. And of course, on March 11, we had the Japan earthquake. And this is what it looks like so far this year. And if we just quickly have a look back here, this is the point that seems to be triangulated last year, and this is the point for this year. Last year, this year. Looking back at 2010, why is it so diffused? If this were, say, triangulating to a point or an object in space, well, one possible explanation is, uh, if there is an object out there that we're triangulating to, that is, the object is not on the ecliptic. We're looking at the two-dimensional diagram here, and this object might be traveling within the third dimension. It could be quite below the ecliptic at this point. Then we get to 2011, it's much closer to the ecliptic. And then 2012, it's even closer to the ecliptic or maybe on the other side of the ecliptic, maybe it's already passed through it, who knows. I of course don't agree with the 188 day cycle hypothesis, simply because the Earth's orbit is not circular, it's elliptical, its speed around the Sun is not consistent, it's slow in one part of its orbit and fast in another part of its orbit, so after 188 days the Earth is actually not in the correct position. Um, however, I would be partial to a 377 day cycle, uh, we'll soon know about whether that is the case or not, in about three days. It is ironic that um, the position of the Moon to fulfill this 377-day uh, cycle would actually fit also with the 188-day date that people are talking about. But I think that's just coincidence on the basis it's 1 in 15 chance of that happening and that's what we've got. Um, so let's have a look at where the Moon and Earth would be from the perspective of the Sun on March 22nd. Okay, so we're positioned somewhere near the Sun right now. Turn around and look towards the Earth. As you can see, this is the position of the Earth. And Mercury's over there. And we'll just go in close and see uh, the situation. Okay, zoom out a bit. Okay, there's the moon, and if we move the clock on a little bit, you can see as the day progresses, the moon actually comes into alignment between the sun and the earth. Okay, so by 1.22 p.m., uh, the moon is approximately in alignment between the sun and the earth which is also falling into approximate alignment with this object we've triangulated to. And it's somewhere in the region of Virgo, of course it could be above the ecliptic, below the ecliptic, or on the ecliptic, or maybe there's no object there at all, maybe the whole thing's a phantom that uh, we're not actually triangulating to anything, it's just some sort of fluke. So of course I've got no way of knowing whether or not there's going to be any sort of major earthquake on that day. But of course there's no harm in taking precautions such as stocking up on water and supplies and essentials and uh, being cautious around coastlines. And hopefully nothing does happen. And uh, also keep in mind that quite often earthquakes, when they do occur, they occur away from populated areas and they go completely unreported, and apart from a few people who are looking at the USGS seismographs and things like that. And of course if something does happen on the 22nd, if we do have a major earthquake, well, I think it's 
time to start seriously looking for an object in this region of space um, that we haven't heard about yet. Okay, thank you for watching. Be safe.